This is homework number six lecture. Uh, here we're going to be talking about recipe scaling and percentages as well as uh, things like percent yield when we're chopping or prepping some food. We're going to talk about food costs a little bit as well. So a bunch of mixed topics here but all of them are based off of percentages which is what this section is all about. So I'm going to again go through the homework question by question and give you an example of each type of problem to give you a better idea on what's going on. So we'll be working with percentages a lot in this section. But before we jump into the uh, idea of percentages in its complete manner, let's talk about like number one, which is an example with recipe scaling. Now, whenever we're scaling the recipe, we're talking about like if we're making more or less of a recipe. You know, if you're going to make more of the recipe, you probably need to double it, triple it. If you need to make less, you might want to half it, maybe one fourth it if it's uh, really big and you can make it that much smaller. But not all recipes are necessarily scaled by easy numbers like doubling, tripling, quadrupling. So we're going to show you a way of finding out how to scale a recipe appropriately. If we look at number one, it says a recipe for banana bread calls for three cups of mashed bananas and nine ounces of all-purpose flour. When you mash all the ripe bananas you want to use up, you measured 7.5 cups of mashed bananas. So the particular question is asking what scaling factor will adjust the recipe so you can use the 7.5 cups of mashed bananas? And then how much flour will you need to use? So in order to do this, we have to figure out what our scaling factor is. Assuming like uh, the banana bread, maybe you're putting more ingredients in besides bananas and flour. Uh, you want to find a scaling factor that scales all of the ingredients. And we're going to use that scaling factor to find out how much is needed for each ingredient. Like the last section, we just did individual ingredients. We're doing parts um, of a recipe, but we can do it this method. So what I like to do whenever we're talking about scaling factor as a scale factor for short, is make it a little equation. The scale factor is always going to be a number. It's not going to have like a unit of measurement or anything. And I like to call it the desired over the recipe. Now, we use desired loosely. You know, desired could be like what you want or what if you have a limited ingredient? You know, uh, you might have to shrink the recipe down so it's not necessarily desired. It's just what you got on you. So we're going to look at what we have and what the recipe calls for. So I like to set it up like this to visually see it in the process. So the recipe calls for three cups of mashed bananas. Bananas. And then it calls for nine ounces of all-purpose flour. I'm just going to put flour down. So I put the recipe on the left side. Our desired, I'll put over here on the right side so we can just visually see what's going on. Now our desired in this case is the mashed bananas. We mashed them up and we got 7.5 cups of uh, bananas. We know they're mashed, but I'm just putting down bananas. As you can see, the recipe is three cups, but the desired or what we have is 7.5 cups. So maybe the chef in this case wants to get rid of all the bananas because they might be going bad soon. So just mash them all up and see what we got. I mean, that's the best way. If bananas are becoming too ripe, the best way to get rid of them is to make some banana bread. So mash them all up, get rid of them, make them useful. And we got 7.5 cups of bananas. Now it's asking what the scale factor is and how much flour we need. So I'm just going to put X cups or not cups in this instance, it's ounces of flour. So X ounces of flour. Let's find out what the scaling factor is first. So I'm going to abbreviate it. Instead of scaling factor, I'm going to say SF equals our desired over our recipe. So in this instance, we need to use these two right here because they're two known values that we have in order to find the unknown, which is the SF. So our desired is going to be our 7.5 over our 3, which is our recipe. These are both in cup units, so what happens is the cups will cancel out. We'll be just left with a number. 
So you do have to make sure that that the unit of measurement is the same for both of them, that it's cups and cups. If they're different, you have to change them to the same unit of measurement. And I'll go over an example like that in a minute. So 7.5 divided by 3. If you divide those two out, you end up getting 2.5. That's your scaling factor for the entire recipe. So because your mashed bananas, maybe those were your limited quantity, that's a main ingredient. You might have a lot of access to flour and I don't know what else you may put in it, sugar. If you want to put in like a little bit of uh, almond extract, I have no idea what you'll put in your banana bread. But you're able to scale all those other ingredients that you probably have a larger quantity of. So 2.5 is what we'll scale everything by. Take that 2.5. I'm going to write it here visually. Three times 2.5 will make the 7.5. So to figure out how much flour we need, we just simply need to multiply the 9 by 2.5 as well. So when you do 9 ounces times the scale factor of 2.5, you end up getting 22.5 ounces. And that's it. So if you had another ingredient here below it, you would just take that new ingredient and multiply it by 2.5 and then you would get your new value for your desired portion. So if the recipe has multiple things in it, which it most likely does, you multiply everything by 2.5 to scale everything proportionally. And that's the thing is proportionate, right? There may be certain things you might not scale proportionately completely, like if there's maybe a really potent ingredient, but for, I mean, for the most part, you do always scale all of them. So let's look at another example. I'm going to go over number three. So number three says a recipe yields 64 three-fourths cups portions. So it says 64 three-fourths cup portions. It doesn't say what it is. So that's what the recipe does. It re the recipe yields that much. What scaling factor would appropriately adjust this recipe so it would yield 80 one-half cup portions? So we need 80 and it'd be one half cup portions. This would be our desired in this case. So to figure that out, we already have a desired and a recipe. We can figure out the scale factor by doing desired over the recipe. But before we do that, we have to convert the numbers first. We, we have to count out all of them. Remember we have, here we go, we have 60, like as in counting 64 three fourths cups portions. So there's 64 portions laying out on the table. We need to convert that to a total amount of cups. So we could just do 64 times 3 over 4. 64 times 3, then divided by 4, ends up making 48 cups total for the recipe. Then for the des desired, it says 80, and that's half cup portions. So 80 times one half is equal to 40 cups. So we end up having a total of 40 cups for our desired. Now what we need to do is go ahead and divide it out. So our desired over our recipe. They're both in cups, right? They're both in cups. So we're set. 40 divided by 48 ends up making, this question is a multiple choice question. You get to choose one. It'd be 0 0.83, three repeats, but 0 0.83 is close enough. Now notice that scale factor is lower. The other one we had a scale factor of 2.5. This one is 0 0.83. So whenever we're reading a scale factor, if your scale factor is greater than 1, that's always going to increase your recipe because you're always going to multiply it by something greater than 1. It could be 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 it could be 2, 5, 10, it doesn't matter. That always increases your recipe. If your scale factor is between 1 and 0, however, that's going to be decreasing your recipe, because you're taking a fraction of it. So 0.83 is a fraction of the total. So like if you did 0.5, that's halving the recipe. If you did 0.5, one, that's one-tenth of the recipe, right? So your scale factor determines if you're increasing or decreasing, and this is key. 
That's how you know if you're increasing or decreasing it. That's a perfect example of it. We show one that's increasing and one that's decreasing. So let's look at number five. This is a soup recipe that yields three fourths of a gallon. So the recipe yields three fourths of a gallon calls for two quarts of beef stock. So there's also two quarts of beef stock in this recipe. So two things, uh, the total amount that it yields, and then it calls for two quarts of beef stock. If you scaled this recipe to yield, so scaled it, meaning our desired, we scale it to yield 18. I'll go ahead and write the number. It wants 18, one cup servings, how many quarts of beef stock, x quarts of beef stock do we need? Now in order to figure out how many quarts of beef stock we need, we need to find out what the scaling factor is. So remember, scale factor is equal to the desired or the recipe, and we take the two known values we have right here, but the thing is they're in different units of measurement. So we'll have to convert the three-fourths gallons to, we can convert gallons to cups or cups to gallons. Either or works, but it's probably easier to do gallons to cups. So if we have three-fourths, remember that's three-fourths gallons, we would have to say times for every one gallon. And according to the, if you don't know it, you can always check the conversion chart, but for every one gallon, we have 16 cups. So you'd say 16 cups. Gallons cancel out. Three times 16 divided by four makes 12 cups. So that's our new one that we're going to use for this. So we're going to change this to 12 cups. I'm going to put the capital C. So we have 12 cups instead. This one, remember, it's 18 times 1, so that ends up making 18 cups total. So if it said 18 two cup servings, like there's a 2 here, we'd still have to multiply that, and that would make 36 cups in total. But here it's 18 one cup servings, so 18 is the total. Now we can find our scale factor. So our scale factor is going to be desired, which is 18 cups, divided by 12 cups. 18 divided by 12 gives us 1.5. So in order to find this out, we had to multiply that by 1.5. So to find this one, we have to multiply it by 1.5. And before we multiply the two, make sure the units of measurement are the same. In this instance, they are. They're both quarts. If they weren't the same, you have to convert one of them before multiplying. Since they're both the same, we can take the two quarts and we multiply it by 1.5, and that gives us a total of 3 quarts. So this answer right here would be 3 quarts of beef stock. And there you have it. So that's an example of having to convert something before we actually multiply everything out. So Keep in mind, like whenever you're doing these conversions, you have to make sure the units are correct. Uh, you don't want to multiply the wrong units of measurement, and that'll affect your whole entire recipe. You'll be wondering, like, why do I only have to use like one cup of sugar on this huge recipe of a cake that I'm making, or something? You know, it'll look a little funny. So let's move on to like what percentages are, and talk about how we convert numbers and percentages. <clears throat> So on number eight, it says a baker discovered that 51 out of 100 loaves had gone stale. What percentage or what percent of loaves had gone stale? To find a percentage of a population of a total, the percentage is usually equal to the part divided by the total or the whole. You say whole or total, it doesn't matter which one you say. But this is a very um, vague concept in terms of the way I'm saying it, like part and whole. It, you could use different 
wording for it, but it's always going to be like the piece you're talking about. The part doesn't necessarily mean it has to be a fraction of it. It could actually be even larger, but it means the one that we're talking about over the total population or the whole. So here it says 51 out of 100 had gone stale. So to figure that out, we always set it up in that ratio, part over whole. That'd be 51 over 100. So 51 over 100 is a fraction, but it doesn't tell us anything about it being a percentage. You know, no one's going to look at a fraction and be like, oh, yeah, I can easily convert that percentage. Just do it for them. 51 divided by 100 makes 0 0.51. So to convert any number, this could be any number, you convert it into a percentage by moving the decimal place to the right twice. Move it to the right two times. What you're actually doing is you're doing 0 0.51 times 100%. And remember what I talked about moving the decimal with a metric system. If you ever multiply a number by 10, you move it over to the right one time. If you divide a number by 10, you move it to the left one. In this instance, if we're, if we're multiplying by 100%, that makes 51%. So this answer right here would become 51%. That's for number eight. So anytime you're going from a number to a percentage, you move the decimal to the right twice. And I'll go over some more examples here in a second. But the thing is, you want to look out for the wording of the word problem. What if we had one that said 51 out of 100 are not stale? Then it asks, what percentage is stale? So look at the wording for this one. This one said 51, the first one said 51 out of 100 had gone stale, and it wants to know what percentage are stale. So it was the number related to stale, and then the percentage that we're trying to find is related to stale in the first one. But on the second one, it says 51 out of 100 are not stale. What percentage is stale? So Think of it this way, 51 out of 100 went stale, or are, are not stale. You say 100 minus 51 to take that number out. That equals 49 left. So if 51 are not stale, that must mean 49 are stale. So 49 out of 100 are stale, and that would simplify to 0 0.49. Move the decimal over twice to the right, that gives you. 49%. So this is a, uh, one I just made up really quick, um, but it's important on the wording, like how it's worded. And you might have a couple problems with a yield percentage later on where the wording is a little tricky and you have to pay attention to how it's worded. When we talk about trim loss, like, oh, what percentage was lost or what percentage is left? There's a difference of what's still there and what's not there. So look out for the wording too. You got to pay attention to the details. So let's check out. Let's check out number 10. So number 10, simple. It wants us to take 6% and write it as a decimal. So what we did earlier was if you had a number to change it to a percentage, you moved it over to the right twice and ate 49%. If you want to go the other way, percentage to a decimal, you take the decimal that's at the very end right here, and you move it to the left twice and put a zero in its place. So that would change to 0 0.06. So every little space you have open when moving the decimal, you got to add a zero in its spot. And that's all there is to it. So moving to the left changes it from percentage to a decimal. Now what if we do, let's see, I'm going to do number 13. Number 13 says change the percentage to a decimal. This one is 0.84 percent. 
Yes, the percentage has a decimal in it, but the percentage isn't a complete decimal. It's still in percentage form. So to change it into decimal form, we have to take the decimal, move it over once, twice. That'd be right here. And that little empty spot, we have to put a zero in. So this would be equal to 0 0.0084. And that would be your answer. Yeah, it looks funky. You have a small percentage right here, 0.84%, and it goes to an even smaller number because that's the number we're actually going to multiply and work with. These numbers, the actual decimals, are what you multiply and divide numbers with. You don't usually do math with the percentages. Percentages and um, arithmetic don't really mix together. You can add a percentage with a percentage. You can multiply a percentage with a percentage, but you can never multiply a percentage with a non-percentage or divide a percentage with a non-percentage. You have to change it into a decimal form. It's kind of like keeping it in the same unit of measurement, if you will, even though percentage isn't necessarily a unit. It's just a form of reading a number. So 0.84% is a small number already. Change it to 0.0084, it's even smaller. It's like my bank savings account interest. They just don't really want to give you any money. That's a bummer. So yeah, they will say like something like, oh, your savings account is 0.9%. I'm like, whoop de doo that's 0 0.009 per, as a number without the percentage. So that's always fun. Now let's look at 16. This one says 0 0.004, and it wants us to change it to a percentage. So again, remember when you change it to a percentage, you got to move the decimal to the right twice, and that changes it to 0.4%. That's all there is to it. You really don't have to do anything else with it. So I'm not going to go over a lot of those percentage questions. I just want to do a couple examples. Now, this one we just kind of went over, number 19. Whenever you're given a fraction, this one says 8 over 25. Remember, like the other one with the loaves of bread, you did 51 divided by 100. You got a decimal. You change it to a percentage. Well, for this, go ahead and take your 8 over 25 and divide it. 8 divided by 25. That makes 0 0.32. Then to change it to a percentage, you have to move the decimal to the right twice. And that makes it equal to 32%. So you have problems like that where you have to change them into a decimal, then a percent. Now, on the number 20, and I think there's another one, uh, 21, it asks you to change it to a decimal, then a percentage. They'll give you a fraction. You have to change it to a decimal and percentage, and that makes sense. You have to divide the fraction first to get a decimal, then change the decimal to a percentage afterwards. And then you get an answer after that. So let's look at the basic equation of a percentage. So I gave you all a rough one, like percentage equals part over whole. The technical, like algebraic way of reading it is supposed to be this. It's P equals A over B, where P represents the percentage. B, in this case, we look at it as like the base, meaning the the uh, bottom number. So when we say base, we usually mean like bottom number. I'm just paraphrasing this instance. And then the A would be your part or your portion. Not sure what they really call it, but I you know, just call it part. They call it just A in the book. So we can use this understanding to figure out what percentages are. It's so like number 22 says, identify P, B, and A for this problem. 55% of 780 is 429. So once it's identified what each part is, what is the P in this instance? Here it would be the 55% because that's the percentage. Then ask, what is the B afterwards? Remember, the B is usually going to be the whole number that we're taking the percentage of. 
and that would be 780. And then it says is, whenever it says is, that's always going to be your A. Think is means equals. So if we see the word is, we want to think equals to. So then our A would then be 429. And that's how those problems work. They just ask you, uh, what is the P, B, and A on a lot of the problems? And 23 will ask you the same thing. Uh, one of them will be unknown, though. But we want to do one where we actually have to figure out the numbers, not just uh, where they tell us the numbers and we just say, which one's P, A, and B? I mean, that's not inherently too difficult. You just got to identify them first. But for 25, it says solve using the percent proportion. Let A, uh, let a represent the amount. So it says 50%, okay, put a little squiggly to divide this, of 40 is what? So we can identify all our portions of this before we put it into our fraction equation that we have up here. We can label this as this is our P. Of number, whenever it says of number, that number that we're taking of is going to be our B. And then remember, if it says is what or is number, that would be our A. So when we set up our proportion, it would be 50%, but we're not going to write 50% as 50%. We're going to change it to a decimal. 50% as a decimal would be 0 0.50 equals A over 40. And you have yourself a proportion. We learned how to solve these back in the last section where we were uh, solving proportions, right? And we did things like cross multiplication. So what we want to do here is do cross multiplication, but we don't have a bottom number here. So we just assume like there's a little one right here. If there's no bottom number written, we just assume there's a one. We go ahead and cross multiply 1 times a and 0.5 times 40. 1 times a makes a, 0 0.50 times 40, 0 0.50 is 50%, so 50% is half. If I take half of 40, that would be 20. Whenever we think about the word of, we'll usually think multiplication. And there's your answer. A is equal to 20. Let's try another one that's kind of similar to that. Let's do number 26. It says find 210% of 90. Now this one doesn't have the A in it. It doesn't say is what, but we can see what everything is by looking at it. This is the P, and then of 90, that would be the B. So we need to find our A. 210% as a decimal, remember the decimal's right here on the very end, we have to move it over twice. That would make 2.1. 2.1 equals A over 90. If you cross multiply, remember there's like a one down here on the bottom. That would be A equals 2.1 times 90. That makes 189. And that's your answer. Now there's different ways to do this problem. You could have done this. Again, when I say find 210% of 90, this of can also mean multiplication. So you can go straight into multiplication. So you're saying find 210%, 2.10 of times, let me send the dot multiplication, 90. And that gives you the 189 right away. So different way of doing it. That's the way I'm personally used to doing it is just multiplying it out uh, because of the word of.
I guess a sales tax, tip, commission, all these other different problems that we come up with in everyday life. So speaking of which, let's try number 32, which is talking about that. It says Elizabeth bought new towels and sheets for $86. It's an exciting buy, I guess. Towels and sheets. It's adult responsibilities. It's for $86, excluding sales tax. So that's uh, the retail price. How much tax did she pay if the sales tax is 9%? So sales tax is 9%. So it's asking how much tax is she paying? Remember, tax is taken off of, there's that word, of, the total price, whatever you're buying of everything. So every time you see a receipt, you'll see like, like subtotal, and then it'll show with tax afterwards, it'll price everything accordingly. So it'll have your subtotal, say like subtotal, and then it'll say your tax, and then it'll just say your total afterwards. Might be different wording for subtotal, might say like gross total or something, but that's a general idea. So we have to figure out what this line is, the tax line. To figure that out, remember tax is based off of the $86. So I could just, let's say using that P equals A over B, the tax is 9% of 86. So $86 times 9%. 9% as a decimal is 0 0.09. Can't move the decimal over twice to the left. 0 0.09. That gives you $7.74. So our subtotal was, wow, that's ugly, eight. Our subtotal was $86. Now our tax is $7.74. You could then find the total of what you owe, 86 plus 7. 0.74, that gives you the $93.74 if you wanted to find out the total. This problem just wants the tax, so you don't have to figure out what the total is on this one. It just wants the tax. But that's how the tax and everything works. You want to find the tax first and then add it to the subtotal. Okay, so let's look at, let's look at number 33. So number 33 says, Paul and Su Yin together earn $3,690 per month. So they earn $3,690 per month. Their mortgage payment is $1,000. So mortgage. Mortgage payment is $1,476 per month. What percentage or what percent of their household income goes toward paying the mortgage? I think we did something. This is probably the last section. There's, I think, a, I think it was the DTI index. It says like what percentage you should be spending on your rent. No higher than that. There's like a set percentage. So here we're going to see if they're above that percentage or not. So what percentage is their mortgage of their total? So it's going to be. P equals the part, which is the one four seven six dollars of the total, three thousand six hundred and ninety. So one thousand four hundred seventy six divided by three six nine zero ends up making zero point four. Zero point four as a percentage is forty percent. That's that's pretty high to be spending about half your income on your mortgage. You know, this isn't including your electric bill, your car insurance, uh, your phone bill, internet bill, um, miscellaneous bills, groceries. You got a bunch of other expenses to spend on it. and then save some money in a savings account, then have some fun money. 40% of your money taken from your household is a little rough, you know. Probably could use a little lower than that. But I don't know, maybe they found a good mortgage plan and they're trying to pay it off as soon as possible. But that's what it is. So that represents 40% of their income. That's a neat way to figure out percentage. If you're ever making a spreadsheet to calculate your expenses, that's one of them. You just calculate what is your total you make per month, roughly, and then 
divide out all your expenses. If you're salary and you have a yearly income, you can easily put your yearly income, calculate how much you make in the year, and then how much you owe in rent or mortgage in the year, and divide everything out. Make a make a payment plan or make a expense sheet so you can keep track of everything. All right, so let's look at number 37. This one's interesting because it throws a, oh, I'm sorry, not number 37. I want to do number 36. So number 36. This one throws off a, a bunch of students uh, because the way it's worded matters. All right, so looking at number 36, it says, Joe has $1,200 to spend on new dining room and table and chairs. So it's saying he has $1,200 to spend on a new dining room table and chairs. All right, make a new place, sprucing it up. If sales tax, the sales tax is 9%, how much can he afford to spend on the table and chairs? Now this question is worded a little weird too. We're saying Joe his absolute maximum is twelve hundred dollars. That's the most he can spend. Period. So you cannot spend any more. It's not twelve hundred dollars on the table and chairs, then tax. It's with the tax and the furniture it totals to twelve hundred dollars, so a thousand two hundred. So we need to account for all of that. This is a way we can do it. We can do think of the purchase price times sales tax gives you just the sales tax. That's what we did on that other problem. But if I wanted to have his total, what I can do is do this. We're going to do the purchase price times the sales tax plus the purchase price percentage included. This is a percent and this is a percent. So the way we look at this idea is um, let's talk about like tipping or something or discounts. Uh, let's talk about like a tip. That's that's a good uh, thing that we can start off with when I mean, we're talking about culinary and restaurants. Tipping is a great thing to talk about. Let's say the bill is like $100. We're keeping it simple. And you want to tip 20%, right? So if you want to tip 20%, you're going to say times 0 0.20. That would then be a $20 tip. Then you take that $20 and you add it to the $100, and that gives you $120 total on your bill. But there's an easier way that you can do this. What if I can skip like this addition part and do the addition in the beginning? So think of it this way. This part represents 100% of your bill. Then you're adding 20% more to the bill. So what you're going to do is 100% plus 20%. Remember I said you can add and multiply percentages together, but you can't add and multiply percentages and numbers separately. So 100% plus 20% is equal to 120%. What we're going to do is we're going to use this number to multiply with it. If I take $100 and multiply it by 120%, which is 1.2, that gives us the $120 right away. It gives us our total. So what we did is we added the percentages first, then multiplied. Versus here, we multiplied, then added the results. Either way works. So I'm going to come back to this problem in just a sec. Let me give you another example of that. Let's say the bill is $72 and you want to tip 25%. Well, if you just want to find out your total bill, you don't want to write down the tip amount. I mean, you could just say, oh, this is going to be the total. 72 times, instead of 0.25, we're going to say 1.25 because this is our 100% and we're adding it with 25%. So 72 times 1.25 gives us $90 total. 
you can use this understanding even with like discounts at a store. What if there's an item that's $200 and it's 25% off? Well, what people do mostly is they'll say times 0 0.25, 200 times 0 0.25 gives us $50, and that's $50 off. And they'll be like, oh, okay, $200 minus $50, that means I'm paying $150 for the purchase. But instead, what you can do is do the percentage off in the beginning. If it's $200 and it's 25% off, well, remember, this is 100%, and you're taking away 25%. So you do 100, oops, not dollar sign. You do 100% minus 25%. That ends up giving you 75% of the price left over. Because you're taking away 25% of the price, you're left over with 75%. 200 times 0.75 will end up giving you the same exact answer. It'll give you your total right away. So if you see something on sale, if it says 70% off current price, like, I don't know, uh, you buy some electronics that are off, but they don't list the new purchase price, or, um, you know, I don't know if you go to, like, get lotions or something, sometimes, or clearance sales, they always have, like, a discounted price, but then they'll say, take an additional 60% off of the discounted price. So what you do is you just multiply it. So if it's 60% off, multiply the new number by 0.4 because you're taking 40% of the price left over. That's all you got to do. If it's 70% off, multiply by 0.3. If it's 20% off, multiply by 0.8. A lot of different tricks. So going back to this problem, I'm going to go ahead and copy it really quick and we'll bring it on over copy. Let's bring it over to the next one. Paste it. This one, remember, it's $1,200 that he has in total to spend. So $1,200 is the total that he has. So we're going to do this. We're going to say it should equal $1,200. The total is going to include the tax and the purchase of the item. So the purchase of the item includes 100%. This is 100%. This is 9%. So that would be 1.09 if I want the total of the two. We need to figure out what that price of the item is. If I multiply those two numbers, we can use what we call the commutative property. I can rewrite that as 1.09x equals... 1200. Just like we learned in the algebra section, in order to solve for x, it doesn't matter if there's a decimal in front, we divide by 1.09 on both sides. And that gives us x equals 1100.92. So the max he can spend on the table and chairs is $1,000. $100.92. That's the max that he can spend on it. Because once we put the tax on it, then it's going to equal to $1,200. So that's where it's a little tricky. Some people will just take $1,200 and multiply by 0 0.09, and then they'll add that number. It doesn't work that way, because then you're taking... 0 0.09, you're taking tax off of a $1,200 product, and then that makes it, like, this would be the wrong way. They'll take 1,200 times 0 0.09, which makes $108, and then they'll say, oh, well, the max he can spend, well, some people say $108, but then they'll take that and add it, and they'll say, oh, well, the max he can spend is 1,200 plus 108, that'd be $1,308. And they'll put that, but that's not true because we're taking 1,200 and 0 0.09. You can't do that. So you have to take the percentage off of the uh, total price, like the lower price, that lower one that we have there. All right, so 
that's enough of percentages. Let's move into food cost and uh, yield percentages. So let's talk about food cost. Number 37 is saying a restaurant is selling an entree for $25. So they're selling an entree for $25. And the cost it is to prepare that entree is $7.50. What is the food cost percentage? That's what we need to figure out. So this is the basic food cost percentage formula. It's, um, you know, again, the wording can be different for everybody. I usually say food cost percentage is equal to what you buy the item for and what you sell it for. And that's really like the cost of anything, what you buy it for, what you sell it for, how much did it cost you and percentage wise. Now, food costs, you usually want to keep it like 25% or lower, sometimes 30%. You know, it really just depends what we're talking about. But your food costs is always going to be what you buy divided by how much you sell it for. So let's go ahead and do this problem. I'm going to abbreviate food costs with FC. FC is equal to we buy it or we make it for $7.50. We sell it for $25. So $7.50 divided by 25, that gives us 0 0.3 and that converts to 30%. So the food cost percentage is equal to 30%. So there's a lot of different things with food cost percentage. Food cost percentage is interesting because it's how we make our profit when selling food at a restaurant. We usually want to keep the percentage low, but not too low to where we're like cheap. You know, we're buying cheap ingredients to keep our food cost percentage low. But let's say the golden rule is 25%, right? So say we have an entree. It costs us $5 to buy it and to prep it. And we sell it for $20. So 5 divided by 20 makes 25%. Right? So this is going to be our food cost. Food cost is equal to buy over sell. You can say cost over sell, whatever you want. Well, what if something changes? Like, what if the ingredients are more expensive? What if it's, we don't know the percentage. What if the ingredients now cost $8? Well, if they're $8 for the cost, we still sell it for $20. Now that increases our food cost percentage to 40%. That's not good. We don't want a food cost that much higher. So what we need to do is, well, maybe we just need to raise the menu price for it. So what if I just raise it? Man, you know, let's just say $5 more. You know, we're just like ballparking. Well, $5 is fine. Okay, let's change it. We still, it still costs $8, but we raise it to $25. 8 divided by 25, that changes our food cost to 32%. More manageable, but, you know, we probably have to sell it a bit more, like a bit more expensive or just take it off the menu. So this isn't a desired one. Say I wanted to be back at 25% exactly, but it still costs us $8. Well, we can solve for that. I can make 25%. I want it to be 25%. And I'm still buying the ingredients for $8. What do I need to sell it for? So I can put an X there as in what should I figure it out for? We can cross multiply. Remember 25% as a decimal is 0.25. So that'd be 0.25X equals eight. Go ahead and divide both sides by 0.25. That means our food cost percentage is 25%, but we need to sell our item for $32. It's kind of expensive, you know, for an entree that used to be $20 because the cost went up three whole dollars. That's a bit, I'm exaggerating a bit when I say up $3. It shouldn't really cost that much in the grand scheme of things. 
but we need to increase the entree to thirty-two dollars. What if the opposite happened? What if the food caught the item went down in price, like your ingredients? Maybe now they're seasonal and it's in season. So you can take like this path where it gets more expensive, or you take this path where it gets cheaper. What if the cost of prep is now four dollars and you still sell it for twenty dollars? Four divided by twenty makes twenty percent. You, as a restaurant worker, could probably live with that. You're like, oh, well, no one will notice the difference. I mean, it's not unethical per se. You just at least know, hey, I can save a buck on each dish if I sell it the same. So this is where I can make my money is like summer or winter time, whenever this thing is seasonal. So this is like, oh, I sell a lot of this, and this is when it's seasonal. I can make more money now because I can buy it for cheaper. Now, if it sells even cheaper, let's say $3, and then you're still selling it for $20, that changes it to 15%. Oh, yeah, you're making some savings now. Like a lot of savings. You can keep it that way. Or if you want to give your customers a break and say, hey, now we're having a sale because it's in season, you want to keep it at 25%. You can, again, say 25% equals $3. What do I need to sell it for? So that'd be 0.25x equals 3. Divide both sides by 0.25. And you end up getting, oops, do it on my calculator. You end up getting $12. You can sell your entree for $8 more and still have a food cost percentage of 25%. Sorry, $8 less. And then customers might go crazy for that. Really just depends. Excuse me, but notice how any kind of increase or decrease in the top or bottom affects the answer. You could increase the selling price or lower the selling price, increase the buying price or decrease it. So notice like when we, when we increased this right here, but we kept the $20 equal, our percentage went up. But then when we increase this to here, our percentage went down. So if you increase the top number, that's going to proportionally increase the percentage because you're having more of it. If you decrease or increase the bottom number, that's going to make your percentage go down. Then over here, if you decrease the top, well, it's going to decrease the percentage. So Increase on top increases percent. Decrease on top decreases percent. So they're the same, meaning they're a, they're a direct proportion. If one increases, the other increases. The other one's the bottom. If you increase the bottom, it decreases the percentage. That's called an inverse proportion. With one increase, the other one decreases. And you can put this stuff into like an Excel spreadsheet, and it can calculate a lot of the numbers for you. Uh, and you can play around with the numbers to see what you want. But if you ever want a desired food percentage, like you desire 25%, you can always solve for the number to figure out what it is. So we'll come back to another example of that in a minute. But let's talk about yield percentage. We say the yield percentage is equal to the EP divided by the AP. So EP stands for edible portion. AP stands for as purchased. This is the one that we use. It's still got that idea of part divided by whole, but we say EP over AP. So edible portion and as purchase, so you buy like a whole pineapple. That's the as purchase portion of it. So whenever you trim it, whenever you trim the pineapple, you might get a percentage of 52%, 55%, depends on how you prep it or what's going on. But you got different yield percentage of it. That would be your edible portion. So like you, if it's by weight, if you're doing the pineapple by weight, well, you lose a lot of weight off of the leaves and the outside rind and everything. You might not even use the core of it. You, know, you might repurpose it for something else in a different recipe, but not this particular recipe. 
So you only use portions of it. That would be your edible portions, the part that you're actually eating. Edible doesn't necessarily mean you can't eat it. It's just meaning that you're not eating it for that particular recipe. You know, there's some instances where you use orange peels for something. You might use them for making like, as I mentioned earlier, or another one, old fashions, you use orange peels, but then you could use the rest of the orange for the orange juice for something else. Use the peels, then use the oranges to make orange juice. It's a way of being uh, very efficient with the fruit. So looking at this problem number 38, this one says a case of honeydew melons contains, so a case of honeydew melons contains 20 pounds of melons. So it's just the melons, not the box as well. Honeydews have a yield percentage they have a yield percentage of 57.5%. That's a pretty steep percentage. How many pounds of diced honeydew melon can you expect to get from the case? So the yield percentage is saying it will yield 57.5% left over. So what you can do in order to figure that out is you'll multiply it. Yield percentage is 57.5% of, there's that word, of 20 pounds. So you'll say 20 pounds, I'll write the pound symbol a little larger, we usually do that, pounds, times 0.575. And that gives us 11.5 pounds of edible uh, melon. So this right here would be our AP, this is our yield percentage and right here that comes out to our edible portion so 11.5 is our answer so what we did is we manipulated the equation in algebra you can manipulate equations remember yield percentage is equal to ep over ap and you can still cross multiply like this over here is like a little one and it becomes AP, as you can see right here, times yield percentage. Equals the one that's down here times the EP, that just makes EP. So this equation right here is the same thing as this equation. They're just changed up algebraically. So we use this one to just figure out what we have left over for our edible portion. So that's what yield percentage is. Yield percentages will vary depending on what we're talking about. Uh, you might be talking about something that's like a veggie oil, so vegetable oil. Vegetable oil usually comes in big old bottles if we're talking about, you know, for the restaurant giant, you know, gallons, liters of vegetable oil. So that is already prepped. The vegetable oil, when you use it, has a yield percentage of 100%. You're not making the vegetable oil. Let's talk about orange juice. You know, if orange juice is bottled, you're using 100% of that. But if you're making your own orange juice, you're using oranges to make the orange juice. So the orange yield percentage is going to be much lower because you're taking the juice out of it. So the percentage for orange juice is going to be lower than instead sliced oranges. Sliced oranges. I'm not sure what the percentage is. It might be something like 95% because you're just not using the, the rind. Maybe you are using the you know, skin of the orange peel for something. But generally, you're just chopping it into pieces to make it little wedges for, I don't know, it could be for a dressing on a breakfast plate or maybe for your blue moon beer or something, you know, put it there on the glass. That's sliced orange. It has a different yield percentage because you're using more of it. But if you're juicing something, you're literally just using the liquid inside of it. You're losing all the skin. You're losing all the fibers inside, the pulp. None of that's being used. So the percentage is going to be lower. It depends on how you use whatever you're using, the way you're using it. If it's already canned and prepped, like if you have, you know, green beans canned, well, you're going to have a yield percentage of 100% for that yield, that green beans, except for like the water it's stored in. Okay, so maybe like 99%.
But if it's prepped green beans, you might use a whole green bean or you might chop off a little bit. Then it's going to have like a lower percentage, 90%. It really depends on how it is, how it's prepped. So avocado will have less if the pit's still in there. You got to do that. But if it's already pitless and you buy it pitless, I don't know if it's already chopped for you or cut up, then the yield percentage is 100% because that's how you bought it. So remember how it is and how it's used when we're talking about things. Generally, if you're juicing something, you're going to have a low percentage. Pineapple juice, orange juice, cranberry juice. Those have lower percentages. Whereas if you're using the actual fruit itself, it's going to have a higher percentage in it. The more of it that you use, the higher the yield percentage will be. What is the yield left over on it? So let's look at number 42 just to revisit that food cost thing. It says an entree is selling for $28 and it has a food cost percentage of 25%. What is the cost of the ingredients used for the dish? So this is that buy over sell. Remember it's food cost percentage equals buy or cost if you want over sell, whatever you want to say. Food cost percentage is 0.25, 25%. We sell it for $28. We're trying to figure out how much we buy it for. So go ahead and cross multiply. 0.25 times 28 gives you seven. One times X just gives you X. You end up prepping it or costing or buying it for $7. And that's all there is to it for that problem. So let's do one last one, number 44. Number 44 is talking about uh, your selling price and your cost, but for like a large group of items. It says you have just developed a new lunch special for your cafe's menu. The full recipe makes 72 servings. So there's 72 servings, writing that down. And it costs $90 for the ingredients. If you want to have a food cost percentage, this is our desired, our food cost percentage of 25%, what should be the selling price for one serving of this lunch special? Sell for one serving. So to figure this out, what we can do is calculate what it would cost to serve or what would we sell the entire recipe for? Then we can divide out the servings. You can do that or divide the servings in the beginning and then find out the cost. So we'll do two separate ways to solve this. And I think this way is going to be the easiest. First of all, the first way I'm going to do it. So if the cost is $90, your food cost, you want to be 25%, 0.25. The cost is $90. How much do you sell it for? Cross multiply gives you 0.25x equals 90. Then you go ahead and divide it out. 90 divided by 0.25. That gives you x equals $360. Now remember, that's how much you would sell the entire recipe for, not per serving. So you have to do 360 divided by 72 servings. 360 divided by 72 ends up giving you $5 per serving. There's your answer. Now what you can do is do the division in the beginning. What if you say, oh, the cost is $90 for 72 servings? You can say $90 divided by 72 servings. 90 divided by 72. That gives you a dollar twenty-five per serving. That's how much it cost. So this is the cost right here. It's a dollar twenty-five per serving. Then you can say 0.25 equals the cost, 1.25, over how much you sell it for. 0.25x equals 1.25. You divide it by 0.25 on both sides. I didn't write that over here, 0.25 divided by 0.25 divided by 0.25. You end up getting 
the same exact answer. So the process doesn't matter. You can divide beginning, then multiply. Or I'm sorry, um, you can divide, then cross multiply, or you can cross multiply, then divide. It really is a preference. But you get the answer the same way on both of them. Me personally, I just want to know how much I would sell the entire recipe for. Not that I am going to sell the whole entire recipe, but it's just easier. And then I divide it and that'll give me the cost per serving. But the second way is kind of helpful. I at least know how much it costs per serving. Oh, it's $1.25 per serving. Not that bad. You know, it only cost me $1.25 and I'm selling it for $5 per serving. That's, that's a what, $3.75 increase in the price. But in, this one tells you in the grand scheme of things, you would sell that whole thing for $360 and you buy it for $90. You're like, wow, okay, off this recipe of 72 servings, I'm making this much. Maybe it's like a large soup or something that's an appetizer that might come with like a salad or something, a soup and salad or something simpler. I'm not sure what, what would cost $1.25, you serve it for five bucks, make some mozzarella sticks at a cheaper place. I don't know, happy hour. It really just depends, but it doesn't matter. It only costs you $1.25. Make those mozzarella sticks $5 because you normally sell them at $8. So $5 per serving is not bad. That's the restaurant industry. There's just a lot of stuff going on when we're talking about cost-wise when you're talking about numbers. Y'all will take a class, menu, and pricing that goes into way more detail figuring out how you would price your own restaurant. You know, you make a mock restaurant, then you figure out the pricing and the menu and everything. That's where all that fun comes in, fun, quote-unquote. And you decide what items sell better, what don't. You know, if it's non-seasonal, probably don't want to sell it because you will have to sell it for more in order to make money off of it. But if it's season, if it's in season, go ahead and sell it. You know, if blueberries are in season and you're at a breakfast place. Heck yeah, make some blueberry pancakes, you know, make them all the time, sell them. But if they're not in season or, you know, they're more expensive to buy, maybe either knock them off the menu or only sell them at a certain time or make them more expensive. It really just depends. You know, strawberry season, all these other things that are in season will affect your menu pricing. One item you might think is popular to sell, it might not end up being popular. You know, take it off the menu if it's costing you too much to keep it on there. It's not worth having food and if it's going to be spoiled and you can't repurpose it. It's food waste for one and two, you know, it's drains a hole in your pocket whenever we're talking about profits and everybody's reason for getting in the restaurant industry is to feed people, make them happy, but make money while doing it. That's what we want to do is make money doing something that makes us happy. Or at least for me. I like teaching. I enjoy it, and that's how I make my money too. All right, well, that wraps up lecture number six for homework number six. This is the first entry of the next two, which a total of three goes into quiz number three. After you finish up number six, go on and head on to Homework number seven, lecture number seven.